no black flies, caught a bunch of salmon. And then I proceeded on the back of the boat to clean them. And I thought black flies were like horse flies. So I was looking and looking for these big horse flies. I didn't realize there are these tiny little things. By the time uh, I developed double vision and I thought I had a retinal tear or something, uh, it was because my eyes were swollen shut. I was like this and I got, uh, so I learned my lesson. <laughs> understood, understood. I had a similar experience a few weeks ago with the black army ants of Costa Rica. Uh, oh goodness. And, oh my gosh, so the same thing. I actually went into anaphylaxis and- Oh my gosh, that's and, a heck of a reaction. And, and I've never had such a reaction before, but I was in the middle of a workout with my uh, training coach on Zoom and Marzi said, the black ants are back. And so I said, oh, I don't know, bye bye. But because my pulse was so high, you know, about 130 or so, um, the ants don't bite you. But if they cross wait, wait, over wait. you. Slow down. If your pulse is high, they don't bite you? No, no. It's got nothing to do with the pulse. OK. Uh, I, I thought that's, that's what you said. Right. <laughs> my pulse was high because I was working out. And uh, the ants don't bite, but if they cross over you, they urinate a little bit, and it's a neurotoxin. Okay. And uh, I had one cross over me a few weeks earlier, and the result was it burned for 24 hours. I could not do anything to get rid of that. I tried to suck it out, oil, tried all kinds of things, nothing worked. Well, in this situation, my pulse was about 130, 135, 140. And I had to get the vacuum cleaner to vacuum them off the wall. Uh, there oh, were thousands, thousands of them, thousands, but three of them. And foolishly, I'm wearing sandals. And three of them, I felt three times, oh, 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 oh. And within five minutes, I collapsed, just completely collapsed. And I was, I was home alone at that point. Uh, I sent my wife and child off in the car um, to leave. And I tried to crawl to the swimming pool to cool off because I was so hot, I collapsed again. And uh, wow. Marzi, my wife, had the intuition, came back and saw me and immediately called. A physician was here in about 15 minutes, shot an epi, shot of steroids, and uh, full, full body hives. Uh, but it was because I was exercising. So my pulse was really high. So my immune system didn't have a chance to deal with a local intrusion. So are, are you allergic or that's what people get? I've never had a reaction like that before in my life. Amazing. It, it was. Uh, it, it Scary was, stuff. Uh, humbling. And we've since learned that these black ants, uh, they, tens of thousands of them, and they walk in one line. Oh, one line. the they, ants they, don't go marching two by two? <laughs> they're one line. That's, that's why they're called army ants, because they, they march right. in a column. Right. And... Uh, uh, the locals say, yeah, when they come, you just leave, just leave. And within three, four hours, they're gone, but they've cleaned out all the eggs of other ants in the house, the eggs of spiders, they kill scorpions, and then they're gone. Wow. Uh, so um, I call them the Borg, you know, that they are just the nastiest. You wow. can't stop those, can't stop. So anyway. Hopefully the black flies won't bother you. In no, I, 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 I've been through it and uh, I'll send you a picture one day. You, you'll get it. I'll text you a picture. You'll get a kick out of it. Nothing like what you went through, though. That's for sure. Uh, well, we, we, we both carry war stories now. Yeah. So hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. It's Tuesday. It's four o'clock Pacific, five o'clock here in Costa Rica, seven o'clock on the East Coast. Midnight in Dublin, 1 a.m. in London and most of Europe, uh, 8.30 and 9.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in Australia, 11.30 a.m. in New Zealand. I hope I've got that right now. Someone will let me know if I'm still messing up New Zealand. And it's Facebook Live. Hello, hello. And uh, this is such a special treat today that we have my friend and colleague, Dr. David Perlmutter with us. And I don't even know, I, I think my staff sent me over some bio to read, but I'm just gonna tell you about uh, David. Uh, he has more guts than any um, physician I've ever met. That from a very early age, um, he's been thinking about why neurology happens the way it happens to people. Why their brain, why their nervous system functions the way it does. His father was a famous neurosurgeon, so he grew up at the dinner table talking shop, 
And he's always asked why, and he's been a pioneer carrying the message of functional medicine and functional neurology and much more out to the world. And I'm sure there have been so many naysayers that have tried to dismiss what he says or uh, challenge uh, what he says, probably in not so nice ways at times. Uh, but uh, David will not give up. We, al we always forgive them. They know not what they do. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, uh, Dr. Perlmutter, welcome, and thank you so much for being Dr. here. Dr. O'Brien, nice to see you again. Uh, we always have such a good time together, so this, I'm sure, will not disappoint. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's the case. And um, we actually, uh, they sent in, people sent in questions when they knew you were going to be here ahead of time. So I'm going to start with a couple of the questions while I bring Facebook up to say hello to people that sign in. I do that every week. Uh, but uh, let's just start with uh, some questions. If we are pre-diabetic, does that mean soon we'll be pre-Alzheimer's? Uh, I think if you're pre-diabetic, you are already uh, pre-Alzheimer's. And uh, I would indicate that I, I, um, I dislike both of the terms. The reason being is that it is not as if achieving, for example, in the case of diabetes, a blood sugar of 126 suddenly flips you from a place of being healthy to a place of having a named disease uh, type two diabetes. It is absolutely um, a continuum. And we recognize now this is an analog scale. It's not a digital scale. I think probably the only digital scale in terms of uh, that we see in medicine is whether you're pregnant or not. Either that's an is or isn't kind of thing. Everything else is gradations, whether we're talking about your blood pressure, your body weight, your blood sugar, your blood sugar control, your insulin receptor, uh, insulin functionality. It's all a continuum. And we're learning um, with time, that those values where <clears throat> traditionally you would test out and people would say, well, you're in the normal range as it relates, for example, to blood sugar, uh, even those values are being challenged as, as being common, but certainly not being optimal. We want to keep our blood sugars as low as possible. And now we have ideas, uh, technologies that allow us to look much more at simply our blood sugar level. And Tom, if I'm going on, let me know, but I, I live and okay. breathe this stuff. And, you know, typically the best test a doctor might say that he or she has is your fasting blood sugar, where you don't have anything uh, after dinner, you come in and it's, and you have a blood sugar test. It doesn't really tell you a lot. If it's really high, then you're in trouble. You may have diabetes and then they're going to put you on a drug, but you know, you can have a normal blood sugar because your insulin is working overtime. Your pancreas is, is cranking out very high levels of insulin. And guess what? It achieves a so-called normal blood sugar. But at that point, uh, when your insulin levels are, are very high, though you have a normal blood sugar, you're already in trouble. You're on the way to what is called insulin resistance. Uh, and that paves the way, that opens the door uh, to the harbinger of, of diabetes and absolutely Alzheimer's disease as well. We now look at the causes of Alzheimer's and believe me, it is not an accumulation in the brain of beta amyloid. We'll certainly have to talk about the FDA drug approval process at some point, but one uh, fundamental idea <clears throat> for the brain is what is called a bioenergetic uh, issue or a problem with the bioenergetics. I mean, it sounds like a, a bit of a uh, colloquial, but it's actually quite descriptive. Bioenergetic means the way that the brain powers itself. And brain scans are able to demonstrate a, a certain type of brain scan that measures the brain's utilization of sugar are able to demonstrate defects in how the brain powers itself 20 to 30 years prior to the clinical manifestations of Alzheimer's, meaning the cognitive issues, the forgetfulness, et cetera. So the notion that uh, you know, there's a pre-Alzheimer's, well, there is, and it's predictable decades in advance. The, the key here with respect to this bioenergetic defect, the defect in how the brain can utilize glucose is brought on by elevation of the blood sugar. This blood sugar elevation challenges how sugar and insulin are able to make their way into the brain and ketone fats 
uh, as well, I might add. So this is a very, very early issue uh, in the pathogenesis or what leads to the failing brain, the bioenergetic defect. And the I think the take home message and certainly Tom, I, I'm sure something that we will hammer away at as it relates to preventing Alzheimer's disease is because these are occurring 20 to 30 years ahead of time, we've got to engage a program early on in our lives that looks at things like energy provision for the brain. In other words, the balance of our blood sugar and how sensitive we are to this hormone uh, insulin, we have to start paying attention to that in, when people are in their 20s and 30s. It's not good enough to wait till the barn door is open and the cow has gotten out when people are in their mid 60s and can't remember their Wi-Fi codes, their grandchildren's uh, birthdays, or what they had for breakfast. Things are really well established well along the way at that point. I'm not going to say it's too late, but the whole uh, notion of prevention as it relates to brain-related disease is something that really has taken hold these days and I think has really been highlighted by this recent issue uh, with this Aduhelm drug that uh, the FDA approved. So when, th thank you, very comprehensive, lots of questions in people's minds already, I can hear them. What kind of a brain test was that? You know, they're, they're asking those kinds of questions. When our function is not staying optimal, so it's going, I, I like to think of it as a boulder going downhill. It's going to reach a point where we have symptoms, but the mechanism has begun higher up the hill and it's rolling down faster and faster. One of the, the, the visuals I try to give people is that there is no way to do this and send it back up to optimal function, that we have to taper. And as we taper, you slow down the momentum of that boulder and then it can roll uphill. But people aren't going to, and the tapering process may not always bring symptomatic relief quickly, uh, that it may take a while. So the motivation to engage a tapering process, the things that we'll talk about here today, the motivation to do that and know that you might not feel better in four days, that you know, it may take a while, the motivation is going to be biomarkers that people realize, oh, this is an early indicator. So you, you talked about a uh, brain scan. Could you be specific in how a patient can ask their doctor for that scan? What would they ask for? And then- well, the, Go ahead. One more part, and then what other biomarkers would you suggest are early indicators that the boulder's rolling downhill? It's, it's an excellent question. First, that uh, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose a PET scan is not available to people. It is a research tool. And it was what discovered these early bioenergetic defects that were the harbinger for later brain decline. But there are some very sophisticated tools that are available for people, for example, to determine if they're at risk or may already be in trouble. One of them is called, it's a very, very sophisticated, expensive tool. It's called a tape measure. And what this tool can do is if it's put around the waistline can tell you right now if you are at risk. So having a bigger belly, and I'm sorry if, if this is offensive, but you know we're here to lay it out. Uh, having a bigger belly, belly is absolutely associated with cognitive decline and risk for Alzheimer's disease. The fasting blood sugar is a reasonable test. It is not a biomarker for Alzheimer's, but I would say if you're going to have a, a fasting blood sugar, have a fasting blood insulin at the same time. Say to your doctor, check my insulin levels, because that tells you if insulin is low and blood sugar is low, you're doing great. If blood sugar is low or normal and insulin is high, you're already having the boulder start to roll down the hill. And our mission, I think, is to keep the boulder from rolling in the first place, is to put things in front of it, and so that it doesn't even start this process that gets harder and harder to stop the further down you go. So I think those, uh, that is a very, very important um, biomarker is your fasting blood sugar. Better than that would be a five hour glucose tolerance test to give you more understanding of the dynamics of what your blood sugar is doing, especially if it is coupled 
with insulin as they measure your blood sugar every hour or two during that test when you first are given a heavy sugar load a 75 gram dextrose or glucose load then we are able to learn what your blood sugar how does your body respond to this challenge do you handle glucose effectively do you pack it into your muscle cells primarily and form glycogen or is there is there a defect in that and that that's what we want to know so we want to learn how your insulin responds so check blood sugar and check insulin in a five hour glucose tolerance test i think that when we look at available technology now that is out of the doctor's office pretty much i'm very excited by what is called continuous glucose monitor that is a way that each and every one of the participants in our time together tonight, uh, Tom, is able, uh, provided a doctor will write them a prescription, but you know what, you can even get this now without a doctor's prescription because there are companies online that have doctors who will talk to you and then make this available to you. This gives you a very precise understanding of your blood sugar moment to moment throughout the course of the day and it transmits it from your arm right to your iphone or whatever smartphone you have and you know what is the effect of that meal i just had on my blood sugar or the five mile run i just went on or the fact that i didn't get a really good night's rest last night how is that impacting my blood sugar so i think importantly very importantly what what i have really emphasized in our entire time together so far is the fundamental role, this is really building upon that first question that we were asked, the fundamental role of reigning in your blood sugar. That is uh, really very much front and center in our modern world, uh, in our world where you know, there are ever increasing rates of obesity, as well as uh, type 2 uh, diabetes, which is rampant globally, uh, which is a manifestation of the dramatic change in the human diet that has occurred over the last 100 years and more aggressively in the past 30 years. So it's just, you know, we are geared genetically to make and store fat and to keep our blood sugars up to power our brains. Everything in our genetics and therefore in our physiology is designed to make damn sure that our brain has blood sugar when it needs it, because our brains are our top tool in the in the toolbox they are our ace in the hole we're not the fastest animal in the forest we're not the strongest in the forest that's for sure but maybe because of the by virtue of our very large and sophisticated brain maybe we're the cleverest uh, you know these days you could probably challenge that uh, but nonetheless that's what we really rely upon the brain uh, at rest is consuming 25 percent of the entire body's expenditure of energy and it only really is about two to three percent of our total body weight. So you see it's a very energy hungry organ. And that explains why these early defects I mentioned earlier in brain energetics are so predictive of who's going to get Alzheimer's and who is not. It's uh, uh, significantly about how we power the brain. Other factors are very important as well. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about them. So for those who are completely overwhelmed by what Dr. Perlmutter just said. Oh, please don't be. I'll break it down. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Because some people have been following us for quite a while and they understand the majority of the terms. Some people have not, they're new. So it's okay. You'll be able to watch this again. You know, it's on Facebook, it'll be there. So you can go back and listen to it again with pen and paper and stop it and write that word down. Don't worry about trying to absorb everything. Today- Let me, let me give some bullet points. Yeah. Number one, one of the most important things you can do to protect your brain and to really chart your brain's health destiny is to keep your blood sugar under tight control. Number two, the fasting blood sugar test that you get at your doctor's office is interesting, but it's not as relevant as it could be. It could be better if the doctor were to check your fasting insulin level as well. Number three, the hemoglobin A1C is also a very crude test in terms of determining or measuring your average blood sugar. Number four, there is technology available today called continuous glucose monitoring that is really effective in giving you a sense as to how well you are controlling your blood sugar. 
Average blood sugar at 100 or less is good. At 90 or less is even better. Marvelous. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Perlmutter is hosting an event that we'll be talking about more through, through the episode on Alzheimer's and the strategies that you can do for that. With that in mind and that topic, Dr. Perlmutter, I was blown away when I'm literally just shocked. You know, there, there, there's not many statistics that shock me anymore, but this one did. Blue Cross Blue Shield published last year in February of 2020 that between 2013 and 2017, in a four year period, there was greater than a 200% increase in the claims for Alzheimer's from their subscribers in four years. And when they broke that down by age bracket, it was a 407% increase in claims for early onset Alzheimer's in 30 to 45 year olds in four years. Now, is that a fluke document that came out or are you seeing more in the literature that says- Yeah, I mean, what, what you're talking about, it, it, it's not just BCBS um, you know, data and they would be ones who are very interested uh, to know that obviously because of, of what that organization is all about. But, you know, alzheimers.org uh, prints that, uh, you know, these are, are uh, Center, uh, Center for Disease Control Statistics are showing us. Uh, we know that, you know, we have 6 million Alzheimer's patients in America now. That number is going up to 14 million uh, by the year 2050. And, you know, I just want to make clear that the sudden jump uh, in the incidence of Alzheimer's is clear indication that it's not a genetic disease. If that were the case, then there would have suddenly been this uh, new gene mutation in humanity in every part of the, of the globe. That doesn't happen. We're dealing you know, with a genome that really has remained very static at least for the past 70,000 years. So we have a genome our DNA evolves over time, over hundreds of thousands of years with the sole intention of keeping us healthy and allowing us to survive. That's what our DNA wants to do for itself or perhaps for us. It's, it's focused on our survivability, our abil ability to, to really remain healthy. So for there to be a gene mutation that codes for a disease like Alzheimer's affecting younger people, as you well described, uh, it challenges the whole notion of what we understand about you know, genetic mutation and about um, how genes code. So it's not a genetic issue. Genetics really are responsible for Alzheimer's in less than 5% of patients. Having said that, we do know that there are some genetic variations that are associated with increased risk. For example, there's something called APOE4, this allele, and you have two of those. You can have two APOE4s, you can have a two, a two, three, a three, four. You either get a two, a three, or a four, and you get it twice. The worst situation in terms of Alzheimer's disease risk is having APOE4, four, four, two of them, uh, associated variably with increased risk for Alzheimer's somewhere between 12 and 14 fold. But that doesn't mean you are destined to have Alzheimer's. More importantly, not having the APOE4 allele doesn't mean you're not going to get it. So, you know, forward thinking people who get their DNA an analyzed, get their 23andMe and see, wow, I don't have the APOE4 allele. I'm not gonna get Alzheimer's. I wish that were true. Uh, I wish nobody got it for that matter, but plenty of people uh, get Alzheimer's without carrying the APOE4 allele. What does it tell us? It tells us there's other factors that are new to the table, literally, uh, that are increasing risk. And two things have happened in our modern society. Number one, our diets have changed in a breathtaking way, challenging uh, our DNA, basically. Number two, we've become a lot more sedentary. We've, be, we've been spending a lot more time sitting on our rear ends and a lot of that sitting is at the dinner table. So, you know, that's the change. It, and that is creating an environment for which our DNA isn't able to adapt quickly enough. 
And uh, in, in the first chapter of a new book that I'm writing called Drop Acid, no, not that acid, it's called Drop Acid. We'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm talking about this environmental evolutionary mismatch where we've evolved with this, this beautiful DNA, that genome that it, it comes from mom and dad, but it's the legacy from all who have come be before us, gifting us this DNA that is pretty near perfect to allow us to survive what changed the environment. That means the world around us, but also our food, our lifestyle choices. We are changing the influences upon our DNA. And as I was writing this book, I remembered that I became uh, involved and interested in this evolutionary environmental mismatch over half a century ago. Actually, it was half a century ago, right this year, when I wrote a, um, an op-ed in the Miami Herald on uh, the, the notion of evolutionary env uh, environmental mismatch. I didn't call it that, but I was just recognizing that we're not evolving quickly enough to deal with the world in which we live. So uh, I've, I've, you could say that I've been uh, interested in this for quite some time. This is the fundamental of the paleo movement, for example. They get it. They, they are leveraging this notion that our DNA wants us to be healthy, but we're getting in the way of, of that effort by throwing at our DNA and therefore throwing at our body's physiology, these uh, things, to, these monkey wrenches that are just messing up the machine. The machine, again, as I mentioned, wants us to be healthy. So we don't have the physiology to deal with high levels of carbohydrates in the human diet. We don't have a physiology that's going to be adapted to being sedentary, to sitting around all day. We do have a hunter-gatherer genome uh, that is designed, for example, to make the most out of every calorie that we get. Uh, that, for example, when we are exposed to a type of sugar called fructose, recognizes that that's a signal that it's late fall and we've got to make fat very quickly because winter is coming. That's what fructose does really to our physiology. It's an alarm signal saying, hey, you better get ready for food scarcity because you're not going to have food. And the only people that are going to survive are those people who make a heck of a lot of fat when they eat fructose. They've eaten berries that they found when they were foraging. Make fat, that survived. Therefore, people who make more fat when they're exposed to fructose are the ones who survived. And that's the genes that got passed on to you and to me and to everyone. Interestingly, not to make it more complicated, hopefully, but how fructose does that is by increasing something in the body called uric acid. That's why my new book is called Drop Acid. It's not about uh, psychedelics, <laughs> uh, too bad. Uh, that said, um, so, you know, the, the body wants to make fat. It wants to create a situation where we have enough glucose to power the brain to get ready for times of caloric scarcity. That doesn't happen anymore. We're preparing our bodies for the winter that never comes. We keep storing fat, raising our blood sugars, increasing inflammation. All three of those are powerful mechanisms involved uh, in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. So in a very real sense, Alzheimer's is the manifestation of this environmental evolutionary mismatch, which means that we are living lives that are challenging our DNA. It's not what our DNA expects and our DNA can't protect us anymore. Brilliantly said, thank you. And it just flows so well. Um, for those who are wondering about the genes and what Dr. Perlmutter said, if you carry the Alzheimer's gene, it doesn't mean you're getting Alzheimer's. It's called an APOE4. You get one from your mother, one from your father. It can be a two, a three, or a four. So you're a two, two, a two, three, a two, four, a three, three, a three, four, a four, four. If you well have, done. <laughs> if you Permutations have, and combinations. Right. If you have one or two fours, it means you're at a higher risk. And that means, you know, if you pull at a chain, it breaks at the weakest link, whether it's at one end in the middle or the other end. And if you have a four, it means you, you've got a weak link in your brain. And so you just need to pay more attention to what you're hearing to here today and listen to it a couple of times and attend the event that we'll be talking about that Dr. Perlmutter is hosting. Because if you carry that gene, absolutely, this is bread and butter to you for a long life, a long, vital, healthy life. 
is to learn these basic concepts. When you first learn them, they're overwhelming. They're completely overwhelmed. There's so much information. But every, if you've heard me before, it's base hits win the ball game. All the little things that you do, and you learn a little bit this week, and you learn a little bit next week, and you learn a little bit, it'll take you six months maybe to dial this down. But who cares? Who cares if it takes six months? At that point, you've got this. You've got this and you've got your system down for you and your family. And you might talk to your friends about it because if you care for them or if they ask you. So don't worry about the gene. Recognize if you have the gene, it's more important that you really dial this down and you spend time, a little bit of time on a regular basis to do this. Critically important to do that. But the gene doesn't dictate you're getting the disease. That's right. And, and I mentioned just a couple of other things. So I'm a 2-3. I do not have that increased risk for Alzheimer's. But um, my father died of Alzheimer's. And, you know, so could I inherit risk? You bet. And therefore, I'm going to offset that risk by virtue of the fact that I keep my blood sugar low that I exercise at least uh, aerobically one hour a day, that I'm really uh, on top of making sure that I get good eight hours sleep every night, which is restorative. I know that through technology that we can talk about it uh, later. I do my very best to avoid uh, being in stressful situations. And uh, you know, there are other things, of course, that we can talk about that are really important. These are the, this is what the science is telling us. The, the media would tell us, look, don't worry about it. You go out and eat whatever the heck you want. And what's this exercise stuff? Stay up late, binge watch Netflix. And if you suddenly get diagnosed with early Alzheimer's, hey, the FDA just approved a drug for you, you're going to be fine. I mean, that's pretty much the messaging. Right. And it, it, is, uh, it is so wrong. It's wrong. pathetic. And yeah. It's heart wrenching because... Um, you know, as a neurologist, I, I, I know what families go through. And then when they say to me, you know, doc, this is really hard for us. And I tell them, I held my dad's hands as he died of this disease. I know what it's like. So the numbers are, are going in the wrong direction. Uh, and unlike, you know, other uh, things that we don't fully understand, not that we fully understand Alzheimer's, but we've got great science out there saying that you can make changes today to dramatically reduce your risk, regardless of your genetic predisposition. And that's what the, the Science of Prevention program is all about. And I'm, I'm certain that you're gonna provide people a link. And uh, you know, that's what we, we've assembled, you know, the, the very top Alzheimer's researchers from around the country, you know, from the very best institutions giving you the information. And um, it's it's time that people hear the other side of the story. Yes. It really, it, really is. It really, it's, it's critically important. That's why I'm so glad that you're doing the event you're doing with the guests you have. And we will talk about that. Um, a question came in, hi to both of you. I heard before, um, just a minute, somebody's messing with this. Uh, I, I heard before that constant red meat consumption leads to stage three diabetes or Alzheimer's due to enzymes in the brain being diverted to reduce insulin instead of breaking down amyloid plaque. Is this true? Actually, uh, there's some interesting knowledge in, in what that person just said. Uh, and let me just walk through that science. It really doesn't have anything to do with red meat. It has to do with blood sugar and it has to do with insulin. And as your blood sugar rises, and insulin rises, ultimately we become what's called insulin resistant. And so insulin is less effective. Well, insulin in the brain does a heck of a lot more than simply help lower blood sugar. What insulin does in the brain are two important things. Uh, insulin um, is a nurturing a hormone for brain cells. They love insulin. Uh, it makes them feel good and function well and protects them. And insulin also becomes uh, what is called insulin degrading enzyme. Uh, or the, the, the enzyme that degrades insulin in the brain is called insulin degrading enzyme. Insulin degrading enzyme is also uh, able to degrade amyloid plaque. Uh, 
So as we have less ability to utilize insulin in the brain, we have less availability of this insulin degrading enzyme, and it's therefore sets the stage for accumulating beta amyloid. Now, this is all about carbs, simple carbs, uh, highly refined carbohydrates, and with all due respect, doesn't have really much to do with eating red meat or any meat or any protein for that matter, unless you're eating so much protein that you're actually stimulating, uh, you're actually activating the insulin pathway, which absolutely can happen. Uh, getting back to, you know, this gets back to blood sugar control. Whether a person chooses to eat that much red meat, you know, there are other things that meat can do that may not necessarily uh, be good for the brain if you're overeating, uh, eating an awful lot of meat. We know there are things that happen in the gut. Uh, there are enzymes that are activated, something called TMAO that can be activated by the gut bacteria that ultimately can prove threatening for uh, heart disease and in terms of blood supply to the brain as well. But again, this is about keeping blood sugar under control. And it's about mostly uh, looking at the number of carbs and the types of carbs, importantly, especially fructose. So um, for people to understand, we're talking about this thing, insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance. I, I'm going to do a little background here. Sugars are circulating in your bloodstream. Insulin is the escort that brings the sugar inside the cell so that your body can use that sugar. And when you are insulin sensitive, that means the insulin works really well. It, 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 it opens up the door to the cell and escorts the sugar in. When you are insulin resistant, it means that insulin's knocking on the door of the cell, but the, the door's locked and it can't unlock the cell to escort the sugar in. So the sugar goes higher in your bloodstream. Exactly. And the insulin goes higher in your bloodstream. And that happens in your muscle cells, but it happens in your brain cells also. So Dr. Perlmutter started by talking about blood sugar and insulin and how important they are. These are easy biomarkers that everyone can learn to follow for themselves. They're not difficult. Now, I talk about also the HOMA score, that you take the insulin and you take the sugar and you throw it into a formula, and it can give you a pretty good idea if you're insulin sensitive or insulin resistant, You know, if you're right on the money or if you need to do some more work in that area. And we've talked about HOMA scores before. Dr. Perlmutter, do you use a HOMA score with? with no, I, I think the HOMA score is inter interesting because it looks, it's actually blood sugar multiplied by insulin divided by uh, 400. So, you know, the higher the blood sugar and the higher the insulin, obviously the higher that score will be. And it gets back to what we talked about earlier that um, you might have a, a normal blood sugar in this formula, but if your insulin level is high, then the total marker or measurement then for using the formula of uh, insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance, however you want to look at it, is higher. And so that's why looking at insulin is really important because your blood sugar test may actually be very normal. And I want to be uh, just take a couple of steps back to indicate that what you described has to do with glucose breakdown product from carbohydrates, glucose uh, free form in the diet, for, uh, glucose that is liberated when we uh, consume table sugar, which is sucrose, half fructose and half glucose. But this is not the mechanism that the body uses to deal with fructose. So insulin is not involved in the metabolism of fructose. And the reason I mention this is because fructose is one of the most commonly used sweeteners added uh, to the more than 60% of the grocery store foods in America that contain added sweetener. In other words, more than 60% of any food that carries a barcode has added sweetener. And by and large, that is a high fructose type of sweetener, typically derived from what is called high fructose corn syrup. Why? Because it's really sweet, so you don't have to use as much and it's really cheap. So that's why it's used. That's why it goes into beverages. It goes into sausage, into ketchup, into, you know, you name it. High fructose corn syrup and therefore fructose is in 
again, a lot of the foods that people consume. And it's oftentimes, you know, clandestine. It's, you don't know it's there unless you read the label. And it, uh, here, it was, uh, I'd like to stop for just a moment. And this is an exercise I want everyone to do when this is done. So as soon as you turn off your computer tonight, you're going to go to your refrigerator and you're going to pick up everything that's in there and just read the label and see how many things have high fructose corn syrup in them. Or they may just say fructose. But in other words, anything with a label on it, you'd be surprised. So fructose uh, is not metabolized using this process. Uh, fructose is absorbed generally in the small intestine and makes its way to the liver where the liver cells metabolize it through another mechanism, if time permitted, we will talk about. It's actually an energy dependent, energy consuming process that depletes ATP. But my, my point is that when we eat fructose, it's not having this effect on insulin immediately. The reason that's important is because marketing and big food has said, well, look, Fructose is a safe sugar because it's not going to interact with insulin and therefore eat fructose. And that's uh, yet again, I think pathetic because here's what we know. We know that the metabolism of fructose uh, will ultimately and dramatically through other pathways lead to insulin resistance. Uh, and, and it may in fact be quite central these days in, in the reason that people are becoming insulin resistant. And it has to do uh, with the way that when fructose is metabolized, it leads to increased fat within the cell and a certain type of fat, uh, a, a certain type of diglyceride uh, actually then translates to uh, insulin resistance. But, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, something to think about when we are told, well, fructose is the safer sugar yeah. Oh, that's just so unfair to people. It is not. And no. uh, oh. so it's it's a bit more complicated, but uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping it's not uh, too complicated. I, I, I think that um, uh, this is critically important information for people. Uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, um, I really am searching for answers based on what I am seeing in my parents in their mid 80s. Hmm. How, how do you truly know the signs? When you are in your mid 80s, how do you know if it's dementia, uh, just a minute, Alzheimer's versus age appropriate memory loss? What are the blatant differentiators we can see in our parents that tell us they are on the Alzheimer's path? Any insight you can give me would be so uh, very, very much appreciated as I am struggling with finding the answers to this question in any article I read. Thank you so much. Well, it's, a, it's really a very important, very meaningful question. And I can tell you first that uh, I feel for that person because I think he or she uh, it feels that there could be a threat out there. And by age 85, 50% of Americans have Alzheimer's dementia by age 85. So, you know, if you live to be age 85, it is the flip of a coin. And that's I don't want to flip a coin, believe me. Uh, that's 50-50 uh, isn't going to work. So uh, I would say that we need to challenge the notion of age-appropriate cognitive decline. Right. You know, we, know, we know centenarians who are sharp as attack. Uh, can there be a, some minimal decline in cognitive function as we age that is acceptable? I would think so. But the notion of old timers versus Alzheimer's, I think we need to kind of delineate. Uh, that generally as we age, our brains should really remain functional, should understand what's going on around us, offer us up the ability for self-care and for decision-making that's appropriate. So, uh, you know, what are the markers? Well, I think we would look at risk markers, first of all, before we, we might talk about how you might know what's going on with mom or dad. Risk markers would be uh, overweight, uh, elevation of blood sugar, history of trauma, history of low educational attainment. Uh, and I will say, uh, I think that there is very likely going to be uh, recognized soon uh, an increased risk of Alzheimer's in people who have experienced uh, COVID-19. 
And we can talk about why I think that may be the case moving forward. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think the other things I mentioned are, are a lot easier to get your arms around. And, you know, understand that, that people in their 80s should very much be interactive and we shouldn't be writing things off as well. He or she is just getting on in years. You know, um, it was uh, uh, eight years ago now that you were a guest on the Gluten Summit, one of mm -hmm. the first health summits ever, and that we, we did. And Professor Michael Marsh, who was in his late 70s at the time, the godfather of celiac diagnosis, the godfather. I went to Oxford, England to interview him for the Gluten Summit. And he had just completed his second PhD after retiring as a gastroenterologist both PhDs wow. from Oxford. So that set the stage for me as to what I want my brain to do in my more elder years, right? So it's not preordained that as you age, your brain is supposed to go. Uh, it's not preordained. It's common to see that, but not preordained. Yes, and again, it's common to see it as it is common to see diabetes yeah. uh, and uh, overweight and frankly, obesity and uh, you know, people, you know, thinking that it's okay to get around now in a wheelchair. I mean, if, if that's how you have, if that's how you need to get around, great, but we shouldn't accept that as we age, we're going to be in a wheelchair and cognitively impaired. We can stay physically and mentally in shape by making specific lifestyle choices today. And that's what's really important. You know, John Kennedy in his inaugural address famously said that the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. And that's Tom, it's what you and I are doing right this minute. It's yeah. saying, look, uh, you know, we start off our time together when I said that these, these very sophisticated brain scans can predict who's on the road to Alzheimer's by showing changes in brain energetics. The important part of that story is you could fix that. So what we see in those people who have changed brain energetics is by offering them up something called the ketogenic diet, as an example, you can still allow those neurons to to begin functioning. It's not that the, we used to see these loss of areas of, of brain function in the Alzheimer's patient on their brain scans based upon the fact that these neurons don't use sugar. Therefore, we thought, well, it's because the neurons have died and they've gone away. And that's why we see these large areas where there's no sugar utilization. That's not the case. What the case is, is that they're still there. They're just not getting what they need to function. They're, they're um, functional, but not functioning. And what is really exciting is the new research that demonstrates, for example, in some people who have that fingerprint, who show defects in brain energetics on the glucose scan, when you put them on a ketogenic diet and provide their brains with ketones, that the neurons light up. They're almost saying, thank you. So, thank you, uh, thank you. I, I have a friend in uh, Australia, Dr. Matthew Phillips, who just published a study demonstrating the effectiveness of putting patients who have established Alzheimer's disease on a ketogenic diet showing improvement. Wow. Now, you know, I, I knew we'd get here sooner or later, but the new so-called Alzheimer's drug never ever demonstrated improvement. It only demonstrated slowing the rate of decline. In other words, the boulder rolling down the hill maybe didn't roll as fast. That is not good enough. And I think, you know, we, we recognize that in America uh, that it isn't good enough. I mean, uh, Mount Sinai, Providence, uh, Cleveland Clinic all rejected using uh, uh, this Aduhelm uh, new drug because that's not a, a, certainly not a cure. It's not even a benefit. And especially uh, in contrast to the risk profile. So uh, I'll just to say one more thing that is so incredible to me that the uh, FDA gave this fast track approval, uh, which is exceedingly rare. I mean, the only other time that we can think of that that's happened has been uh, with the uh, COVID vaccines. And there was a real good reason for that. And the fast, uh, you know, the expedited approval of this Alzheimer's drug, which now is being questioned, uh, there was no reason to do that. There was no data to support it. And, you know, gratefully and wonderfully, we're seeing pushback for a drug that could cause 
could cost people $56,000 a year. That hasn't even been proven to be effective. All right, I'll leave it at that, but I had to get there. Yeah, and thank you, thank you for that. You bet. Yes, yes. So let's move on to your event that begins soon. Um, uh, you're, you've interviewed some of the world leaders. Please tell us who you have on your event and a little bit about the event. And we are posting the link now so everyone Good. can write, register for it. Wonderful. So <clears throat> uh, my mission, uh, uh, stated mission has been uh, to be a doctor. Doctor means teacher, it doesn't mean healer. Teacher means giving information uh, and that means empowerment. Uh, the, the other side of the story is never told. Again, as I just described with this drug, we're basically told live our lives, come what may, and then we'll fix your problems. Eat what you want, become diabetic, and we'll put you on metformin or you know whatever other drug we're, we think is great that day. Uh, that doesn't work for me. You know, I mentioned the John Kennedy quote that the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. There's another quote from the, the Yellow Emperor, the Na written in the Neijing in the fourth century uh, BCE, which says that prevention is the ultimate principle of wisdom. To cure a disease after it has manifest is like digging a well when one feels thirsty or forging weapons when the war has already begun. Well, the war has already begun. And if we're going to sit around and wait for a pharmaceutical weapon to be developed, we're seeing how that is failing us. We've got to keep the boulder in your metaphor on top of the mountain and not let it slide down. So it, it, as that is a, a preamble, I would indicate that uh, I'm not the smart, the sharpest knife in the, in the deck, the smartest guy in the world, but I know a lot of smart people, you are included in that group. And as it relates to the brain, I reached out to some very smart people. And basically, as you've done so many times with the Gluten Summit, for example, I spent time with them. I interviewed them. I recorded the interviews. Uh, then they were edited and they were put into a package. And the package is what you're now linking to for all of your viewers, the science of prevention and deals specifically with keeping your brain where you want it. We have experts that look at metabolism like Dr. David Ludwig. Uh, from Harvard School of Medicine, experts uh, in Alzheimer's like Dr. Dale Bredesen, experts in the interesting science of neuroplasticity, how one nerve connects to another nerve, uh, Dr. Michael Merzenich. I mean, he is the father of neuroplasticity and kindly agreed uh, to, to meet me, fly to New York from the West Coast and meet me uh, to do this interview. We, we study uh, and look at sleep, we look at stress, we look at toxins, we look at uh, how to keep your blood sugar where it needs to be uh, to keep the brain healthy. So we created you know, this incredible panel of individuals uh, who really just give their, their heart is all in. Uh, they did this uh, really just to, to get this word out and give you the tools. And I, I know I get kind of carried away in talking about the stuff in terms of maybe getting a little bit too much into the weeds. And, I, and I, I don't do it to be confusing. I do it because it's so interesting. Uh, and I admit I have at times trouble stepping it down, but I think that my role in the interviews of these individuals was to hear what they had to say and then reinterpret it in such a way that every audience is going to get what that individual just told us. And at the end of each one, I summarized, and here's why you need to get a good night's sleep every night. Because for example, as it relates to sleep, that is what we just learned. That's when the brain activates its clearing out process. It takes the garbage out, if you will. It activates, if you wanna be a little more technical, the glymphatic system, which is when the brain takes away uh, the byproducts of metabolism, a uh, damaged cellular debris, if you will. And it's really important that we take out the garbage. And we just learned how that happens and why you have to get a good night's sleep. And we also just learned why uh, certain things can interfere with a good night's sleep, like caffeine after 2 p.m. or the time of day you might choose to exercise, or importantly, being on a computer screen late in the evening and having that blue light 
interfere with your body's production of melatonin, interfering with, with your sleep. So again, while I might get a little carried away with a little of the science, uh, it, it is presented in such a way that uh, in bite-sized portions, you can, you can really understand uh, what we're talking about and most importantly, feel empowered with the tools to protect uh, your brain and really choose, chart, architect your brain's destiny. So what I'd like people to understand about this event is that you've just listened to Dr. David Perlmutter for an hour. And no way. It's been an hour. Oh my gosh. And you see how his ideas flow and how easy it is to be with him. And it may be hard to remember all that stuff, but that's okay. It's all recorded and you, you can listen to it again. And so, and Dr. Perlmutter has read the research papers of every one of his guests. And so he knew the questions to ask them. So that what you're going to hear is David Perlmutter interpreting what the geek of geeks on neuroplasticity, who tries to bring it down to everyday language for us, but David is going to interpret it even more for you. And at the end, a summary, here's the bullet points of what we just said in this interview. I'm very excited about this myself. I've registered for it and I recommend everyone, as soon as we're done here, you register for it. And you will, and you may not watch all of them, but they're available. You know, you'll be able to, if you spend $59, it's free, it's free to watch. But if you say, wow, I've listened to two of them and I've learned a lot already and I don't have time to listen, spend the 59 bucks because, or 69 or whatever it is. Sorry, David, I don't know. I don't know. What <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> I should yeah, know. Right, right. You know, but my point is you won't get higher quality information on brain function than this event hosted and overseen by David Perlmutter. There will be nothing, there's nothing out there that is of this quality. So register for this event. After you've registered and you turn off your computer, go to your refrigerator and read the label on everything that's in there and see how many of them have fructose, high fructose corn syrup. Just see where you currently are with your pickles, your ketchup, your mustard. Just see what's in the refrigerator. David, thank you so very much oh, for gosh. taking time especially out of your vacation. I mean, you're, you're in Northern Ontario in the woods in a cabin in the woods. So well, I'm, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm finishing a book manuscript, uh, but it, uh, it's, it, I, I normally live in Florida, which is not where you want to be in July and August, I guess. And, and uh, this is a family cottage that my, my wife has had in her family for 80 years. So there's a lot of memories here. You know, our kids grew up here and now we're waiting for grandchildren. It's really quite, it's, uh, it's a great place to be. But anyway, Tom, good to see you. Don't let the ants get you. <laughs> or the flies. <laughs> oh, you we got it. All right, my friend. We'll talk soon. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.